chapter forty one of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter forty one the right man in the right place the very next day i was afloat as a seaman of the royal navy of the united kingdom none but a sailor can imagine what i felt and what i thought here for years i had been adrift from the very work god shaped for me wrecked before my time by undue violence of a frenchman also i had bred my son up to supply my place a little and a very noble fellow though he could not handle cutlash or lay gun as i had done but he might have come to it if he ever had come to my own time of life this however had been cut short by the will of providence and now i felt bound to make good for it only one thing grieved me viz to find the war declining this went to my heart the more because our navy had not done according to its ancient fame anywhere but at gibraltar and with admiral rodney in the year before i rejoined it off the coast of america things i could not bear to hear also the loss of the royal george the capture of the leeward islands and of minorca by the french and even a british sloop of war taken by a french corvette such things moved me to the marrow after all i had seen and done and all our ship's company understood that i returned to the service in the hope to put a stop to it this reclaiming of me to the thing that i was meant for took less time than i might use to bring a gun to its bearings that beautiful miss carey managed everything with captain drake and in less than fifty kisses they had settled my affairs i could have no more self-respect if i said another word but the king and the nation won the entire benefit of this it came to pass that i was made a second instructor in gunnery with an entire new kit found me and six and tuppence a week appointed together with second right to stick a fork into the boiler of course i could not have won all this by favour but sure merit it had however been allowed me under an agreement just enough yet brought about by special love of justice that i should receive a month ashore at newton nottage in the course of the spring whenever it might suit our cruising my private affairs demanded this as well as love of neighbours and strong desire to let them know how much they ought to make of me how i disdained my rod and pole and the longshore life and the lubberly ways when i felt once more the bounding of the open water the spring of the buoyant timbers answering every movement gallantly the generous vehemence of the canvas and the noble freedom of the ocean winds around us the rush up a liquid mountain and the sway on the balance of the world then the plunge into the valley almost out of the sight of god though we feel him hovering over us while the heart leaps with the hope of yet more glorious things to come the wild delight the rage suspense and majesty of battle nothing vexed me now so much as to hear from private people and even from the public sailors that the nation wanted peace no nation ever should want peace until it has thoroughly thrashed the other or is bound by wicked luck to knock under hopelessly and neither of those things had befallen england at this period but i have not skill enough to navigate in politics and before we had been long at sea we spoke a full-rigged ship from hamburg which had touched at falmouth and two german boys in training for the british navy let us know that peace was signed between great britain france and spain as nearly as might be on valentine's day of the year seventeen hundred and eighty three a sad and hard thing we found to believe it and impossible to be pleased after such practice of gunnery nevertheless it was true enough and confirmed by another ship and now a new ministry was in office under a man of the name of fox doubtless of that nature also ready always to run to earth 
nothing more could be hoped except to put up with all degradation a handful of barbarous fellows wild in the woods and swamps of america most of them sent from this home country through their contempt of discipline fellows of this sort have been able mainly by skulking and shirking fight to elude and get the better of his britannic majesty's forces and pretend to set up on their own account as if they could ever get on so no one who sees these things as clearly as i saw them then and there can doubt as to the call i felt to rejoin the royal navy of course i could not dream that now there was rising in a merchant ship captured from the frenchman and fitted with two dozen guns a british captain such as never had been seen before nor will ever be again and whose skill and daring left the frenchman one hope only to run ashore and stay there however not to dwell too long on the noblest and purest motives it did not take me quite three weeks to supersede the first instructor and to get him sent ashore and find myself hoisted into his berth with a rise of two and two per week this gave me eight and fourpence with another stripe on my right arm and what was far more to the purpose added greatly to the efficiency of the british navy because the man was very well or at any rate well enough in his way and in his manners and quite worth his wages but to see him train a gun and to call him first instructor captain bampfylde saw in twenty minutes that i could shoot this fine fellow's head off unwilling as i was to give offence and and delicate about priming and all the men felt at once the power of a practised hand set over them i saw that the navy had fallen back very much in the matter of gunnery in the time of the twenty years or so since i had been gun captain and it came into my head to show them many things forgotten the force of nature carried me into this my proper position and the more rapidly because it happened to occur to me that here was the very man pointed out as it were by the hand of providence for parson chowne to blow up next our captain had the very utmost confidence that could be in him and he stood on his legs with a breadth that spoke to the strength of his constitution a man of enduring gravity also his weight was such that the parson never could manage to blow him up with any powder as yet admitted into the royal dockyards i like this man and I let him know it but i thought it better for him to serve his country on shore a little after being so long afloat if as i put it to his conscience he could keep from poaching and from firing stackyards or working dangerous ferries he told me that he had no temptation towards what i had mentioned but on the other hand felt inclined after so many years at sea to have a family of his own and a wife if found consistent this i assured him i could manage and in a few words did so asking for nothing more on his part than entire confidence my nature commanded this from him and we settled to exchange our duties in a pleasant manner i gave him introduction to the liveliest of the farmer's daughters telling him what their names were and being over full of money he paid me half a crown apiece for thirteen girls to whom i gave him letters of commendation this was far too cheap with all of them handsomer than he had any right to and three of them only daughters and two with no more than grandmothers but i loved to help a fellow sailor and thus i got rid of him for our captain had the utmost faith in this poor man's discretion and had thought before i said it of laying him up at narnton court to keep a general lookout because his eyes were failing i did not dare to offer more opinion than was asked for but it struck me that if parson chowne had been too clever for david llewellyn and made the place too hot for him he was not likely to be outwitted by naval instructor heaviside however i could not see much occasion for chowne to continue his plots any longer or even to keep watch on the house unless it were from jealousy of our captain's visits as far as any one might fathom that unfathomable parson he had two principal ends in view the first was to get possession of miss carey and all her property by making her mrs chowne number four the second which would help him towards the first was to keep up against poor captain drake the horrible charge of having killed those two children whose burial had been seen as before related 
and here i may mention what i had forgotten through entire want of vindictive feeling to wit that i had as a matter of duty contrived to thrash very heavily both of those fellows on braunton burrows who had been spying on narnton court and committed such outrages against me without doing this i could not have left the country conscientiously and now on board the alcestis a rattling fine frigate of forty-four guns it gave me no small pleasure to find that although the gunnery practice was not so good as i was accustomed to in seamanship and discipline and general smartness there was little to be reasonably complained of especially when it was borne in mind what our special duty was and why we were kept in commission when so many other ships were paid off at the conclusion of the war up to that time the alcestis had orders to cruise off the western coast not only on account of some french privateers which had made mischief with our shipping but also as a draught ship for receiving and training batches of young hands who were transferred as occasion offered to halifax or the west indies station and now as the need for new forces ceased captain drake was beginning to expect orders for spithead to discharge instead of that however the admiralty had determined to employ this ship which had done so much in the way of education for the more thorough settlement of a question upon which they differed from the general opinion of the navy and especially of the ordnance board this was concerning the value of a new kind of artillery invented by a clever scotchman and called a carronade because it was cast at certain ironworks on the banks of the river Carron this gun is now so thoroughly well known and approved and has done so much to help us to our recent triumphs that i need not stop to describe it although at first it greatly puzzled me it was so short and light and handy and of such large calibre moreover with a great chamber for the powder such as a mortar has that at first it quite upset me knowing that i must appear familiar yet not being so however i kept in the background and nodded and shook my head so that every one misunderstood me differently that night i arose and studied it and resolved to back it up because only captain drake was in its favour and the first lieutenant heavy side was against it strongly although he said that six months ago the rainbow an old forty four being refitted with nothing else but carronades of large calibre had created such terror in a french ship of almost equal force that she fired a broadside of honour and then surrendered to the rainbow but to come back to our alcestis at the time i was promoted to first place in gunnery over and above her proper armament of long guns eighteen and twelve pounders she carried on the quarter-deck six twenty-four pounder carronades and two of eighteen in the forecastle so that in truth she had fifty-two guns and was a match in weight of metal for a french ship of sixty guns as at that time fitted afterwards it was otherwise and their artillery outweighed ours as much as a true briton outweighs them now naval instructor mr llewellyn had such a busy time of it and was found so indispensable on board the alcestis that i do assure you they could not spare him for even a glimpse of old newton nottage until the beginning of the month of may but as i always find that people become loose in their sense of duty unless girt up well with money even as the ancients used to carry their cash in their girdles i had taken advantage of a run ashore at pembroke to send our excellent parson lower a letter containing a five-pound note as well as a few words about my present position authority and estimation i trusted to him as a gentleman not to speak of those last matters to any untrustworthy person whatever because there would be six months pension falling due to me at swansea at the very time of writing and which of course i meant to have for my zeal in overlooking my wound could not replace me unwounded i trow but knowing our government to be thoroughly versed in every form of stinginess and peculation which was sure to be doubled now a fox was in i thought that they might even have the dishonesty to deny me my paltry pittance on account of ancient merit and great valour upon the shabby plea that now i was on full pay again they would have done so i do believe if their own clumsy and careless ways had allowed them to get scent of it but they do things so stupidly that a clever man need never allow them to commit roguery upon him and by means of discreet action i was enabled for fourteen years to draw the pension i had won so nobly as well as the pay i was earning so grandly 
however these are trifles the five-pound note was for mother jones to help our bunny with spring clothes and to lay out at her discretion for my grandchild's benefit supposing as i must needs suppose that church warden morgan in face of his promise would refuse indignantly to accept a farthing for the child's nourishment he disappointed me however by accepting four pound ten and mrs jones was quite upset for even bunny never could have eaten that much in the time charles was a worthy man enough as undertakers always are but it was said that he could not do according to his lights when fancy brought his wife across them poor mother jones was so put out that she quite forgot what she was doing until she had spent the ten shillings of change in drawers for her middle children and so poor bunny got nothing at all nor even did poor barty for this little dear i had begged to be bought for the sake of her vast imagination nothing less than a two-shilling doll jointed both at knee and elbow as the dutchman turned them out it was to be naked like parson chowne's folk but with the girls at the well stirred up to make it more becoming and then mother jones was to go to scar and in my name present it all things fail unless a man himself goes and looks after them and so my five-pound note did and when i was able to follow it complaint was too late as usual but you should have seen the village on the day when our captain drake as we delighted to call him found himself for the first time able to carry out his old promise to me made beneath the very eyes of his true love isabel the thought of this had long been chafing in between his sense of honour and of duty set before him by the present naval board and but for his own deeper troubles though i did my best for ease he must have felt discomfort if i chose i could give many tokens of what he thought of me not expressed nor even hinted yet to my mind palpable but as long as our navy lasts no man will dare to intrude on his captain be it enough and it was enough that his majesty's forty-four gunship alcestis brought up as near as her draft allowed to porthcall point on the fifth of may seventeen eighty three this was by no means my desire because it went against my nature to exhibit any grandeur and i felt in my heart the most warm desire that master alexander macraw might happen to be from home that day nothing could have grieved me more than for a man of that small nature to behold me stepping up in my handsome uniform with all the oars saluting me and the second lieutenant in the stern sheets crying farewell mr david also officer ship marked upon every piece of my clothes in sight and the dignity of my bearing not behind any one of them but as my evil luck would have it there was poor sandy mac himself and more half starved than ever such is the largeness of my nature that i sank all memory of wrongs and upon his touchings his hat to me i gave him an order for a turbo inasmuch as my clothes were now too good and my time too valuable to permit of my going fishing this however was nothing at all compared with what awaited me among the people at the well all newton was assembled there to welcome and congratulate me and most of them called me captain llewellyn and every one said i looked ten years younger in my handsome uniform i gave myself no airs whatever that i leave for smaller men but entered so heartily into the shaking of hands that if i had been a pump the well beneath us must have gone quite dry but all this time i was looking for bunny who was not among them and presently i saw short legs of a size and strength unparalleled except by one another coming at a mighty pace down the yellow slope of sand and scattering the geese on the small green patches mrs morgan had kept her to smarten up and really she was a credit to them so clean and bright and rosy-faced at first she was shy of my grand appearance but we very soon made that right now i will not enlarge upon or even hint at the honour done me for having done such honour to my native place because as yet i had done but little except putting that coat on to deserve it enough that i drew my salary for attending to the old church clock also my pension at swansea and was feasted and entertained and became for as long as could be expected the hero of the neighbourhood and i found that mother jones had kept my cottage in such order that after a day or two i was able to go to scar for the purpose of begging the favour of a visit from bardie 
but first as in duty bound of course i paid my respects to colonel lougher as luck would have it both the worthy colonel and lady bluett were gone from home but my old friend crumpy their honest butler kindly invited me in and gave me an excellent dinner in his own pantry because he did not consider it proper that an officer of the royal navy should dine with the maids in the kitchen however unpretending might be his behaviour and here while we were exchanging experience over a fine old cordial in bursts the hon rodney without so much as knocking at the door upon seeing me his delight was such that i could forgive him anything and his admiration of my dress when i stood up and made the salute to him proved that he was born a sailor a fine young fellow he was as need be in his twelfth year now and come on a mitching expedition from the great grammar school at cowbridge to drink his health both crumpy and myself had courage for another glass and when i began to tell sea stories with all the emphasis and expression flowing out of my uniform he was so overpowered that he insisted on a hornpipe this although it might be now considered under dignity i could not refuse as a mark of respect for him and for the service and when i had executed as perhaps no other man can this loyal and inimitable dance his feelings were carried away so strongly that he offered all the money left him by a course of school-work and amounting to fourpence halfpenny if i would only agree to smuggle him on board our alcestis when she should come to fetch me this of course i could not think of even for a hundred pounds and much as i longed for the boy to have the play of his inclination and in the presence of crumpy too who with all his good will to me would be sure to give evidence badly if his young master were carried away and under such love and obligation to the noble colonel i behaved as a man should do when having to deal with a boyish boy that is to say i told his guardians on the next opportunity but to break away at once from all these trifling matters only one day came to pass before i went to poor bardie all along the sea-coast i was going very sadly half in hopes but more in fear because i had bad news of her what little they could tell at newton was that de she was almost dead by means of a dreadful whooping cough all throughout the winter and the small calibre of her throat and charles morgan had no more knowledge of my warm feeling thither way than to show me that he had been keeping some boards of sawn and seasoned elm two feet six in length and in breadth ten inches from what he had heard about her health and the likelihood of her measurement when i heard this you might knock me down in spite of all my uniform with a tube of macaroni people have a foolish habit when a man comes home again of keeping all the bad news from him and pushing forward all the good if this had not been done to me i never could have slept a wink ere going to scar manor to me that old house always seemed even more desolate and forlorn with the summer sunshine on it than in the fogs and storms of winter perhaps from the bareness of the sand-hills and the rocks and dry stone walls showing more in the brightness and when woods and banks are fairest i looked in vain for a moving creature there seemed to be none for miles around except a sullen cormorant sleeping far away at sea only little dutch was howling in some lonely corner slowly as when her five young masters died as i approached the door in fear of being too late to say good-bye to my pretty little one yet trying to think how well it might be for her poor young life to flutter to some guardian angel my old enemy black evan stood and barred the way for me i doubt if he knew me at first sight and beyond any doubt at all i never should have known him if i had chanced to meet him elsewhere for i had not set eyes on his face from the day when he frightened us so at the inquest and in those ten months what a change from rugged strength to decrepitude you cannot see any one in this house he said very quietly and of course in welsh every one is very busy and in great trouble every one evan black i feel sorrow for you and have felt it through all your troubles take the hand of a man who has come with good will and to help you he put out his hand and his horn was gone i found it flabby cold and trembling a year ago he had been famous for crushing everything in his palm you cannot help us neither can any man born of a woman he answered with his black eyes big with tears it is the will of the lord to slay all whom he findeth dear to me is de she dead i asked with a great sob rising in my throat like wadding rammed by an untaught man the little sweetheart is not yet dead but she cannot live beyond the day 
she lies panting with lips open what food has she taken for five days any one whose nature leads him to be moved by little things would have been distressed at seeing such a most unlucky creature finishing her tender days in that quiet childish manner among strangers tenderness in her weak defeated state with all her clever notions gone she lay with a piece of striped flannel round her the lips that used to prattle so now gasping for another breath and the little toes that danced so limp and frail and feebly twitching the tiny frame was too worn to call and could only shudder faintly when the fit came through it yet i could see that the dear little eyes looked at me and tried to say to the wandering wits that it was old davy and the helpless tongue made effort to express that love of beauty which had ever seemed to be the ruling baby passion the crown and stripes upon my right arm were done in gold at my own expense for government only allowed yellow thread upon these her dim eyes fastened with a pleasure of surprise and though she could not manage it she tried to say how boofly end of chapter forty one chapter forty two of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter forty two the little maid and the midshipman in this sad predicament i looked from one to other of them hoping for some counsel there was moxy crying quite as if it were her own child almost and there was peggy the milking-maid allowed to offer her opinion having had a child although not authorized to produce one also myself in uniform and black evan coming up softly with a newly discovered walk and yet not one had a word to say except poor little dear sometimes and sometimes we must trust in god i tell you i cried that never does and i never knew good come of it a man's first place is to trust to himself and to pray to the lord to help him have you nothing more to say here be all her little things black evan whispered to his wife put them ready to go with her his two great hands were full of little odds and ends which she had gathered in her lonely play along the beach and on the sand-hills is that all that you can do watkin could do more than that and now where is young watkin they assured me there was no more to do they were tired of trying everything as for watkin he it was who had brought the malady into the house and now they had sent him for change of air to an uncle he had at linvey concerning delushy there was nothing for her to do but to die and to go to heaven she shan't die i tell you i cried out strongly you are a set of hopeless ones twice have i saved her life before when i was only a fisherman i am a man in authority now and please god i am just in time to save her life once more my friends do you give her up you stupids they plainly thought that i was gone mad by reason of my rise in life and tenfold sure of it they were when i called for a gown of red pembrokeshire flannel belonging to moxy for ten years now however poor moxy herself went for it and i took the child out of her stuffy bed and the hot close room containing it and bore her gently in my arms with the red flannel round her and was shocked to find how light she was down the great staircase i took her and then feeling her breath still going and even a stir of her toes as if the life was coming back to her what did i do but go out of doors into the bright may sunshine i held her uncommon and clearly shaped face on my bosom to front the sunlight and her long eyelashes lifted and her small breast gave three sighs good-bye all of you i cried she comes away with me this minute peggy may come if she likes with half a sheep on her back to-morrow and so she did and i could not give her less than half a crown for it because of the difference and the grace of god to darling bardie in my arms the whole way home she lay like a new-born lamb almost with her breath overcome at first and heavily drawn while her eyes were waking then as the air of the open heaven found its way to her worn-out lungs down her quiet 
eyelids dropped with a sleepy sense of happiness and her weak lips dreamed of smiling and her infant breast began to rise and fall quite steadily and so she fell into a great deep sleep and so i took her to my home and the air of newton saved her our bunny was very good there could hardly have been any better child when her victuals were not invaded she entered into bardie's condition and took quite a motherly attitude towards her and while the tiny one lay so weak bunny felt that the lead of mind was hers for the present and might be established by a vigorous policy however in this point she was wrong or at any rate failed to work it out in a fortnight bardie was mistress again and poor bunny had to trot after her now although it was very pleasant to see the thankfulness of black evan when he came over every day and brought his pockets full of things and tried to look pleased when truthful bardie refused outright to kiss him pleasant also for me to be begged not only to fish but even to shoot perhaps because now the wrong time of year in and over and through a place where the mere sight of my hat had been sure to lead to a black eye under it in despite of all these pleasures i perceived that business must be thoroughly attended to and taking this view i was strengthened in my own opinions by the concurrence of every neighbour possessing a particle of sense not only mother jones who might be hard from so much family but also the landlord of the jolly quite agreed with the landlady and even crumpy a man of the utmost tenderness ever known almost and who must admire children because he never yet had owned any all these authorities agreed that i must take care what i was about for my part finding their opinions go beyond my own almost or at any rate take a form of words different from my own and having no assurance how it might end i felt inclined to go back and give fair play to both sides of the argument but as often happens when a man desires to see the right and act strictly up to it the whole affair was interrupted and my attention called away by another important matter and the duty springing out of it and this came to pass in the following manner it happened upon oak apple morning that i was down on a little sand-hill smoking a pipe and with both children building houses upon my pumps these pumps had lovely buckles of the very latest regulation and it was a pleasure to regard them when at leisure and reflect upon their quality as well as signification the children however took this matter from another point of view and there was scarcely anything to their little minds more delightful than to obscure my pumps with sand and to put up a tower over them and then if i moved down came the hole and instead of themselves they laughed at me i had worked very hard in the alcestis and for almost a week after landing found it a most delicious thing because so incomprehensible to have nothing whatever to do but long before now i was tired of it and yearned to put on my old slops again and have a long day of fishing as if bunny's life and mine hung on it and when i gave a feast of turbot caught by that excellent sandy macraw and paid for at just what he chose to charge you would not have guessed it but such were my feelings that i only could make believe to eat and sandy himself by special desire took the foot of the table and went largely into everything but behaved uncommonly well for him now this is just the way i keep on going out of the proper track if i could not train a gun much straighter than i can tell a story france would have conquered england i believe in spite of nelson it is the excess of windage coming down to me from great bards which prevents my shot from flying point-blank as it ought to do nevertheless the village children loved my style especially since his majesty had embellished me and this was why i shunned the well and sat among the sand-hills for really it was too hard to be expected to have in throat a new story never heard before every time a little pitcher came on the head of a little maid to be filled and then to go off again bardie and bunny knew better than that and never came for stories till the proper time the twilight now as i was longing much to sacrifice all dignity and throw off gold lace and blue cloth and verily go at the conjures which i did the next day and defied the parish to think what it chose of me i beheld a pair of horses with a carriage after them coming in a lively manner towards my nest of refuge 
it is useless now i cried aloud i can hope for no more peace everybody knows me or believes it right to know me nevertheless on the whole i felt pleased when i saw that the harness was very bright and the running gear knopped with silver and my amazement was what you may enter into when really the driver proved to be no bigger than that little master rodney blewett he had the proper coachman by his side for fear of accidents but to me who had seen so much of horses now in devonshire it appeared a most rash thing to allow such a boy to navigate however having caught me thus he jumped out without accident while the coachman touched his hat to me or to his majesty as now represented by me then that noble boy as he ought no doubt to be entitled being the son of a nobleman although in common parlance styled an honourable boy which to my mind is no more than a simple contradiction up he ran with his usual haste expecting to find only bunny and me but his astonishment was worth seeing on account of his being such a fair young chap when suddenly he beheld poor bardie standing weakly on her legs not quite re-established yet and in her shy manner of inner doctrine taking observation of him a more free and easy schoolboy there could scarcely be than rodney and as for our bunny he used to toss her until her weight overpowered him but with this little lady looking so pale and drawn and delicate he knew as if by instinct that he must begin very gingerly captain llewellyn he said i am come to tell you that my mind is quite made up i mean to go to sea as soon as i can have my clothes made but young sir i answered with a wish to humour this fine boy yet a desire to escape the noble colonel's anger it is useless now to go to sea there is no war we must wait and trust the lord to send one and how shall i be fit to manage a ship and fight our enemies unless i begin at once and practise captain llewellyn in this there was so much truth as well as sense of discipline moreover such fine power of hope for another good bout at the french that i looked at my pocket lappets for an answer and found none i can stand a great deal he cried on account of my age and so on but i can't stand latin and greek and i cannot stand being put off always i know what they want me to do they want me to grow too old for the navy and i do believe they will manage it i am getting twelve every day almost and i can pull a pair of oars and fire a cannon nine inches long and sail a boat if it doesn't blow for all that i can answer sir my words were being proud of him and you know who taught you this and that and you know that he always did impress upon your early mind the necessity of stern discipline and obedience to superiors your first duty is to your king and country in the glorious time of war but with a wretched peace prevailing your duty is to the powers placed by providence to look after you i have heard that till i am sick of it he answered rather rudely for i seem to myself to have put it well is that all you can do for me i had better not have come at all look i have five guineas here given me yesterday and all good ones i will put them just in there and my word of honour my boy if it were fifty five hundred or five thousand would an officer of the royal navy think of listening to them you have hurt my sense of honour i beg your pardon captain llewellyn he said hanging down his head but you used not to be quite so proud you used to like five shillings even that is neither here nor there i answered very loftily and increasing his confusion five shillings honourably earned no man need be ashamed of but what you have offered me is a bribe for the low purpose of cheating your good uncle and dear mother you ought to sink into the sand sir he seemed pretty nearly fit to do so for i put a stern face on though all the time i could hardly keep from laughing most good-naturedly when a little hand went into his and a little face defied me poor sick bardie had watched every word and though unable to understand she took hot sides with the weaker one e sant sink into e sand i tell a e yicked bad old davy hot's a done to be cold so i's ve angy wi a indeed to go on so to a gentleman by what instinct could she tell that this was a young gentleman 
by the same i suppose by which he knew that she was a young lady and each of them ready to stand up for the other immediately it made me laugh and yet it is a sad thing to go into now my boy i began for fear of losing the upper hand of them you are old enough to understand good sense when put before you it is true enough that if you mean to walk the planks like a sailor you can hardly begin too soon at the time of life you are come to i was afloat at half your age so far as i can remember but i am bound to lay before you two very serious questions you will have to meet and never escape from every kind of dirt and hardship narrowness and half starving not an atom of comfort left such as you are accustomed to danger i will not speak of because it would only lead you on to it but the other thing is this by going to sea you will for ever grieve and drive out of your prospects not only your good uncle but perhaps almost your mother i thought i had made a most excellent speech and bardie looked up with admiration to know when i meant to finish but to my surprise young rodney took very little heed of it that shows how much you know old davy why i was come on purpose to tell you that they are tired out at last and that i may go to sea if only you will appoint me a place on board of your ship alcestis now do captain llewellyn and i will never forget it to you if ever i become a great man my dear boy i would do it this minute if i had the power but though they call me captain here i am only captain of a gun and instructor of artillery and even our captain himself could not do it he could only take you as a volunteer and now there is no call for them you must get your appointment as midshipman in the regular way from london and the chances are fifty to one against your joining the alcestis that is to say of course unless you have some special interest his countenance fell to the lowest ebb and great tears stood in his bold blue eyes but presently the hopeful spirit of youth and brave lineage returned i will write to my brother in london he said he has never done me a good turn yet perhaps he will begin this time not to be too long about it either by that or some other influence he obtained his heart's desire and was appointed midshipman with orders to join the alcestis upon her next appearance off our coast you should have seen the fuss he made and his mother too about his outfit and even colonel lower could not help being much excited as for me i was forced to go to and fro betwixt newton and candleston court every day and twice a day for the purpose of delivering judgment upon every box that came but when master rodney made me toss his spelling-books and grammar at his breast to practise parrying with his little dirk i begged him to let me take them home as soon as he was tired i have them now with his little stabs in them and they make me almost independent of the schoolmaster in writing not only was i treated so that i need not have bought any food at all except for bardie and bunny but also employed at a pleasant price to deliver lessons every morning as to the names of sails and ropes and the proper style of handling them we used to walk down to the hard seashore with a couple of sharp sticks whenever the tide allowed fair drawing-room and the two little children enjoyed it almost as much as the rising hero did the difficulty was to keep the village children who paid nothing from taking the benefit of my lecture as much as midshipman blewett did and they might have done so if they cared to do it for i like a good large audience but they always went into playing hopscotch in among my ropes and yards when all done beautifully in fine sand and ready to begin almost for the proper way is to have a ship spread naked first and then hoist sail if you want to show its meaning i could not bear to be hard upon these young ones and some of them good mother jones's own all in a mess of activity and i tried to think that it was all right because money was earning anyhow but i could not reconcile it with my sense of duty to make a game of well-paid work therefore i kept the children out in a manner i need not now describe only you may rely upon it for real ingenuity for children are worse to manage than folk who have been through having them End of chapter 42chapter forty three of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore 
chapter forty three a fine price for bardy now our own two little darlings have behaved so beautifully gazing at the bad works of the others from a distance only though sadly pushed to share in them and keeping their little garters up when the others were hopscotching also feeling and pointing out and almost exaggerating the ruin wrought by the other small ones which they durst not come down to help that i determined to give them both a magnificent sunday dinner i would gladly have had the young midshipman down for on sunday he was such an ornament as good as the best church window but now our time was almost up and though his mother would have let him come to grace my humble cottage the colonel insisted that he must go to take farewell of some excellent aunts from whom he had large expectations and who had ordered him up for the sunday to the neighbourhood of cardiff however we could get on very well with our own aristocracy only which i was sure poor bardie was though without any aunts to dine her and it only made me the more determined to have a family party fed on good fare we envied nobody as we sat down and the little ones put up both hands according to some ancient teaching for the first course we had conger baked a most nourishing excellent dish full of jelly and things for children and this one was stuffed like a loaded cannon with meat-balls pork fat and caraways bunny went at him as if she had never secured such a chance in her life before but bardie seemed inclined to wait for what was coming afterwards and spent the time in watching bunny with admiration and contempt mixed as they are on a child's face only then i brought in the dish of the day with bunny skipping and going about and scorching her fingers to help me but bardie having gone into her grandeur sitting at table steadfastly and with a resolute mind to know what it was before approval she had the most delicate nostrils but what i brought made her open them because i had the very best half of the very best ham ever cured in our parish through a whole series of good luck luck and skill and the will of the lord must all combine for a first-rate ham and here they were met and no mistake both by one another and by excellent cooking afterwards it would not become me to say any more when it comes to my mind that the delicate gold of infant cabbage by sight of it was also of my own planting in a bit of black mould in a choice niche ere bethel jose had tempted me in spite of all this wonderful cheer and the little ones going on famously the sight of that young cabbage struck a vein of sorrow in me somewhere to go away and leave my house and garden for whole years perhaps and feel that it was all behind me in neglect and loneliness with no one to undo the windows or to sow a row of peas or even dib a cabbage in and perhaps myself to find no chance of coming back to it and none to feel the difference like a knife all this went through me so that i must look upward quite for fear of the little ones watching me those two little creatures ate with a power and a heartiness enough to make anybody rejoice in the harmless glory of feeding them after the very first taste they never stopped to wipe their lips or to consider anything but dealt with what they had won and felt and thoroughly entered into it only every now and then they could not help admiring what i take to be the surest proof of a fine ham and good cookery that is to say bright stripes of scarlet in between fat of a clear french white not unlike our streaky jaspers interlaid with agate to see that little thing who scarce could lift a finger three weeks ago now playing so brisk a knife and fork filled me with gratitude and joy so that i made up my mind to finish my dinner from the conger and keep the rest of the ham for her i gave the little souls their wine as they called it of gooseberry water a good egg cup full apiece and away they went like two little women into the garden to play with it 
and see who would keep it the longest then i put the rest of the ham in the cupboard and returning to the conger began to enjoy the carver's privilege of ten minutes for his own fork but just as i had done handsomely well and was now preparing to think about a pipe a fine navy tobacco and a small nip of old rum and water suddenly my door was darkened and there stood the very last man save one whom for my comfort and calm sabbath feeling i could ever have wished to see peace be to this house he began with his hands spread out and his eyes turned up but his nostrils taking sniff of things peace be to this humble home and the perishing flesh contained in it brother davy is it well with thee brother hezekiah said i perceiving what he was up to no flesh does this house contain for that it is too humble but in the name of the lord right welcome art thou to cold conger brother i pray thee arise and eat and go forty days hence on the strength of it it hath been done replied hezekiah by divine grace and unceasing prayer but come old chap i am sure you have got something better in that cupboard stinking fish hast thou often sold me and lo i have striven to like it therefore give me good meat now and let us rejoice at thy great doings this speech was so full of truth that it got the upper hand of me both by the sense of compunction and the strength of hospitality and i could no longer deny to perkins all that remained of poor bardie's ham i have expounded the word of the lord i have been as lot in your little zoar he cried going on for the third help of ham my spirit was mighty within me david and hepzibah took up the wondrous tale backsliding brother where hast thou been there is a movement and revival set afoot from my burning words and hepzibah's prophecy such as shall make your rotten old church have a drop of beer i said for i did not like to see him shake his fist at our church tower well i don't mind if i do he answered now i come to think of it everything in its season brother and a drop of your old rum afterwards i pretended not to hear this last for though i might stand him in two penny ale i saw no reason for spoiling the tops of a bottle or two that i scorned to open even when my rheumatics had leapt from my double half ribs to my eardrops so after observing that things were locked up i ran into the jolly and fetched a pint of small ale very rapidly not expecting me back so soon he had made a good round with his knife in his hand to see what might be hoped for now back he came with a groan and said that he knew not what he was fit for when the power of the word came upon him he had such spasms afterwards i never love to be in company with a man of this sort when my time has come for thanking god for a fine dinner i would rather be alongside of a simple man and a stupid one who can sit and think with me and say no more about it he knew my feelings i do believe and enjoyed them like pickles with his meat and after finishing every morsel even down to the mark of the saw upon the very knuck of it up he put his tallowy thumbs with the black nails outwards and drew a long breath and delivered in the name of the lord amen and now brother david rejoice a little as behooves a christian man upon the blessed sabbath day hezekiah i have rejoiced to behold your joy in feeding and to minister thereto now having fruition of fleshly things take the word of the lord o my brother and expound doctrinally though it be but a score of chapters i will smoke and hearken thee strong meat is not for babes my son and a babe art thou old dio chaps like you must wait and watch for the times of edification there is a time for sowing and there is a time for reaping small ale is not meat for such as bear the burden of the day kaia the smith i asked very shortly what is it you would have of me brother davy i have offered a blessing on thy flesh-pots and good they were though not manifold it is comely that i should offer another blessing on thy vessels davy what could i do with such a man in my own house brother hezekiah became at my expense most hospitable i found no escape from my own bottle without being rude to my visitor's glass and yet i enjoyed not a single drop for want of real companionship 
for all my wits were up in arms as if against parson chowne almost because i knew that master perkins wanted to make a fool of me so i feigned to be half seas over that he might think he had done it ancient friend he began at last when he thought that i was ripe for it thou hast lifted me above the height of edification peradventure i say words that savour not of wisdom beloved brother the fault is thine here i am and there you are how can any man having a smithy of his own go on so and thou wert not tipsy kaya thou couldst see the contrary i am here and thou art there just so you have put it wonderfully he answered after thinking we may both say right is right which is the end of everything keziah said to me go seek where he is and how he is because i have seen noble visions of his exaltation and yet you see exalted brother scarce the tenth part came to her she knows what she is about said i she dreamed of a red-hot cradle and the hoof of satan rocking me now i see the whole of it it was parson chowne and the ferry-boat and the catch i was all but burned in perkins tell me more my friend i have groaned much for neglecting the warning of the prophetess how many men have groaned in vain for that same cause old dio vainglorious males they doubt her gift because she is a female out of the mouths of babes and women brother i forget the passage but it comes to that i think and now she hath been again in trouble concerning what o hezekiah as concerning what i pray thee even touching the child delushy in the godless house of scar in a holy trance it hath been vouchsafed to her to behold that poor kid of the flock bearing in her mouth a paper whereupon in letters of blood was written come over and help us and we have found a way to help her with thy faithful testimony in his crafty sheep's eyed manner made of crawling piety mixed with sharp and spiteful worldliness he began to feel my soundings towards a scheme so low and infamous that my blood within me boiled for being forced to bear with him he had prepared the whole plot well and what it came to was just this inland there lived a wealthy smelter of the methodist tribe and hezekiah was deep in his books for long supply of material rees ap rees was his name and he longed as every year he grew older to make up for an ancient wrong which was coming home to him in the early days when he was poor and clever and ambitious he had ousted his elder brother from his father's hearth and banished him this poor fellow fled to the colonies and for many years no token and no news came home of him meanwhile rees ap rees was growing elderly and worn out with money which is a frightful thing to feel but about a year ago a half-caste sailor had come into his house bringing a wretched death scrawl from this supplanted but never yet forgotten and only brother there were not a dozen lines but they told a tale that made the rich man weep and eat dry bread for days and days his brother having been born without the art of getting on at all was dying for want of food and comfort having spent his last penny to keep the mouths of his two little babes at work these poor children had lost their mother and were losing their father now who with his last breath almost forgetting wrongs as we do in death very humbly committed them to the charge of his rich brother and he said that his only remaining friend captain of the nova scotia had promised to deliver them safe in bristol to be sent for the dying father had no strength to speak of their names or age or any other particulars now it so happened that rees ap rees was dearly fond of children as all rich childish people are on account of being denied them and since his wife died he had often thought of adopting some one but being rich he was fidgety now and none of the children in his neighbourhood ever blew their noses so here he found as it were from heaven two little dears coming down upon him his next of kin and right heirs and also enabling him to go to his parish churchyard with a sense of duty done although preferring to rest elsewhere if by law allowable you may suppose how he waited and watched but those two little dears never came upon that he longed for them so much more that he offered a reward of a hundred pounds for any tidings of them and of two hundred pounds for both or either brought to his house in safety hence it will be clear enough what hezekiah's scheme was and half the reward was to be my own 
all thou hast to say good dio is what thou saidest at the very time that the ship was not called andalusia but to the best of thy belief was more like nova scotia also that she was bound for bristol and that the other baby's clothes bore no coronet as they fancy but the letter r done fancifully as might be by a freemason such as the forefather was said to be that garment must be destroyed of course i have one prepared for the child de Lushy, with martha ap Rees in faint writing upon it this the old man must find out for himself after our overlooking it he will then believe it tenfold and after the sight of thy uniform dio ha how sayest thou old friend a snug little sum to invest for old age thou knowest the old saying scurvy in the navy but the navy's self more scurvy when thou art discharged with three halfpence a day one hundred pound with accumulations save one hundred and fifty pounds then will help to buy sulphur for thy rheumatics myself will give thee ten per cent for it upon sound security it sounds very well said i to lead him one hundred and fifty pounds have a fine sound not only that my noble boy but the hold thou wilt have on a rich young maiden such as martha ap Rees will be the old fellow can't last very long none of those smelters ever do and he hath heart disease as well little martha will come into twenty thousand pounds or more and every penny of it hanging upon thee and me my lad is it well devised is it grand my boy is it worthy of old kaya that it is i cried most worthy he flourished his glass in the pride of his heart and even began to sing a song with a chorus of spankadillos forgetting whose holy day it was unfortunately i did the same for my nature can never resist a song moreover i wanted to think a little not from any desire to dwell for a moment on my own interest but from the great temptation to make the fortunes of our poor castaway but while i was nursing my left knee with the foot giving time for another chorus which was just beginning i heard a tiny pipe and turned round and there was the little thing herself dancing on one foot and jerking the other in mockery of my attitude nodding her head to keep time as well and for her very life singing out panky dillo 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 while bunny peeping round the door-post with a power of sabbath feeling looked as if the world were ending it was clear that bardie had not seen perkins whom she never could endure else she would not have run in from the garden to bear a share in our melody and that good brother was so full of his noble scheme and his song and my rum that he never noticed her baby voice and her quick light figure was out of his sight from the corner of his boozing therefore i managed to get her away and send her for a good walk with bunny to look for watercress at brewis well for i thought it wiser to keep that perkins ignorant of her whereabouts and bunny could be trusted now to see to any one anywhere off went the heavy one very gravely and the light one full of antics even in front of the cottages singing panky dillo which hit her fancy so that i feared some disrepute at such a thing going forth from our house upon a sabbath evening i tried to frown but she made me laugh by turning round and clapping her knee exactly as she had seen me do and it seemed the best thing to go back out of sight ere neighbours got the key to it little she guessed that the fate of her life was dancing in the balance and that her own lights and play had turned it whether for good or evil how could i let such a spring of life such a mischievous innocence and thoroughly earnest devotion to play sink and be quenched by a formal old methodist in the iron district scar house was dull enough for dry bones but there at least she had the sands and sea and shells and rabbits and wild fowl nor any one to terrify her with religious terrors which to the young are worst of all unless it were a ghost or two of wicked abbots repenting whereas i knew what an old compunctious methodist is who has made some money and devotes his last years to the service of jehovah even twenty thousand pounds could not make it up to her therefore i shook master perkins up for he really had been a little too free and was going to sleep with his spectacles stuck for a corkscrew into another bottle and i made him understand that his plan was a great deal too crooked for me and that the sooner he went to seek hepzibah 
who was prophesying on a stool for pickling pork down at betsy matthews and to prepare for his midnight service with a strong revival rising the better chance he would have of escaping my now rapidly growing desire to afford him total immersion which is the only salvation of one highly respectable lot of them in the well of john the baptist hezekiah dreaded water so much that his hint was enough for him and off he set in a tipsy shamble to lie down on the sand-hills ere he came face to face with the prophetess when i had put things a little aright and brushed up the hearth to a bit of fire to warm the milk for the little ones and by opening doors and windows sweetened all the place with summer flowing in and nestling round the relics of the sunset and when the neighbours chairs whereon the very old men had been sitting for their sunday evening creaked as if carried in and dusted for another sunday and there was not one child left except a bad child by the well whose loose mind was astray with stars and took no heed of supper-time then the two best children in the village neighbourhood or county hand in hand came to my door they were wonderfully silent and they stole each in her own manner just a little glimpse at me to feel how my temper lay then they looked at one another to exchange opinions on that all-important matter they knew that they had been out too late and had frightened granny a little perhaps and therefore now had angered him and in their simple way they thought it wiser not to broach the question i meant to scold them but could not find it when i beheld their pretty ways within my power to do so and lucky for them that i did not know until next day when too late to scold what a dreadful mess their clothes were in in that light i could only see their pretty faces glowing and their bright eyes full of doubt and their little bodies shrinking back also bundles of watercress put forward to mitigate righteous wrath i felt that i had been having my spree and these small creatures had only had theirs so i kissed them both and gave them good supper and blessed them in their little bed End of chapter 43chapter forty four of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter forty four provides for education having before me several years of absence from home if it should please the lord so long to spare me i now took measures for the welfare of those who would chiefly miss me the little cottage was my own from many generations and in a new will made by a clever man no less than our new schoolmaster i left it to bunny and all my effects except my boat and the sum of ten guineas which two items as honour demanded were for miss delushy but what is wealth without education no more than a plummet without the line knowing this i provided as follows a thoroughly fine new schoolmaster had arisen as aforesaid for the purpose of educating all our newton children our good parson had brought him in not because the old one being challenged by the village tailor to spell the word horse without the picture proved his command of the alphabet by accomplishing it in nine different ways all wrong for that was entered to his credit when the tailor failed to do the like but because he horsed a boy and left him there for the afternoon having fallen asleep without thrashing him and it shows what the public confusion of mind is that there were not three people in all the parish who could help jumbling these stories together because each of them had a horse in it however the poor old man had to go and colonel lower having nothing to do with the spelling of the children thought it so hard on his brother's part that he made the old man his head gardener so as to double his wages and enable him to sleep not half but the whole of the afternoon his successor in the school had been sought out very diligently and he could spell almost as well as bardie could pronounce a word but when we found that he came from a distance more than a quick man could walk in a day and that he could not through all his forefathers although they were quite at his finger ends claim so much even as intermarriage with any of our third-rate families much less with any llewellyns or hopkins or bevans or even thomases we saw that even parson lower had gone a little too far for us 
and not a woman in the place would let a bedroom to that man however we could not bolt him out of his own schoolroom and there he slept contented with a pile of slates for bedstead and of copy-books for bolster and for pillow for a week at least he had no school but he went to church and sang beautifully which brought half the women over and the children began to be such a plague at home before monday morning that eight or nine were sent back to school as if with halters round their necks with these he took so much kind trouble that in three hours they learned more than the parish had learned for a generation so much that they could not keep it down when they went home for dinner in the afternoon there were twenty pupils and by the end of the week three dozen but how could they prove him to their parents qualified for a bedroom upon the strength of my present position and unrivalled experience i found it my duty to come to the fore and take the command of the householders and knowing of course what a waste of time it is to reason with anybody i seized the bull by the horns and offered master roger burke rolls the occupancy of my cottage upon most liberal conditions that is to say for rent per quarter one sea snail and per annum one cockle shell to preserve the title provided nevertheless and upon this express condition that my lawful granddaughter bunny should be fed alimented sufficiently nourished clothed clad apparelled and in garments found also taught instructed and doctrined educated and perfected in every branch of useful knowledge by the said roger burke rolls item that if a certain child of tender years known as delushy should at any time appear on the premises and demand instruction instruction of the highest order and three slices of bread and butter should be imparted to her without charge de die in diem i objected to these d a s as being of a nasty churchyard sound but master roger convinced me soon and must have convinced a far tougher fellow that to put our latter end out of sight and out of mind so is a bad example and discouragement for the young ones whose place it is to dwell on it a man of far coarser tone of mind than mine would be required to describe master roger's sense of gratitude towards me when i do a handsome thing i cannot bear to tell of it nor even to receive the praise accruing from what neighbours know do it and be done with it in all such cases is my rule and if roger chose to give me an inventory of goods and chattels he can bear me out in saying that i scorn to call a witness in to put his name to it business is not my strong point and it never is with a man of largeness the next thing for me to see to was to get some wicked warrants quashed which a deep ignorance of my character and the lies of very low villains had induced some weak or vicious magistrates to issue so that in the sporting season when i might have done my best i was forced to decamp with my telescope this has been mentioned perhaps before but not my strong resolution to face it out as soon as ever the sense of a strong position enabled me no doubt they had meant to do their duty and i forgave them altogether there were three of them two names i quite forget how can one think of such trifles at sea but the third was one master anthony stew who had tyrannized over me dreadfully in the times of my tribulation up to this man's gate i went and rang the great bell with my three stripes on and a cap of fronted tapestry squire anthony was about somewhere on the premises would my honour mind waiting while the boy went round to look for him this maid never guessed how often she had told me my fish was bad and what a shame it was to make them eat it up in the kitchen or starve and where did i hope to go to neither did she recollect how she had as good as made me kiss her behind the meat-screen when my glory began to grow for saving those drowned niggers and yet i could not be sure that she did not know it all and hide it all for the joy of boasting afterwards i understand everything except women when i was shown into the drawing-room and mrs stew with a curtsey went out as if afraid to trust herself in a presence so imposing i had a great mind to take a nip at some of the rubbish upon the table the whole of these knick-knacks could never have paid me half what this fellow had cost me in fines expenses costs and so on 
without a bit of evidence from any man of character however i only looked at them when that low anthony stew came in he knew me before i could speak almost he gave a quick glance at the table and then without another word showed me out in spite of all my uniform to his dirty little justice room with such a man i should think it wrong to go into his ribaldry only he said this at last davy thou thief we will withdraw them because we cannot execute them now thou art in royal service five there are if i remember does your conscience plead to more my conscience pleads to none your worship perjured scoundrels all of them five was the number i do believe alas what may we come to the gallows dio the gallows thou rogue thou hast had some shavings but when thy turn comes good dio i will do thee a good turn if i can will your worship tell me why i never look for anything but the flint edge from your worship because thou art the only rogue i never was a match for there go thy way now go thy way or i shall be asking thee to dinner nay your worship god forbid what food have i had since breakfast time and so i won the last word of him after this provision for my good repute and defiance of magisterial scandal on behalf of bunny my next act was one of pure generosity towards an ancient enemy poor sandy macraw had a very hard fight to maintain himself and his numerous and still increasing family sometimes they did not taste so much as a rind of bacon for months together but lived on barley bread and dog-fish or such stuff as he could not sell with oatmeal cakes for a noble treat every other sunday what did i do but impart to him under document drawn by burke rolls that license to fish off and on scar point which my courage had well established with authority to him and covenant by him to attack and scare all poachers the whole to be void upon my return if so i should think proper and not only this but i put him in funds to replace all his tackle by enabling him to sell his boat for i went so far as to lease him my own at a moderate yearly rental upon condition that he should keep her in thorough repair and as good as new and for the further validity as the lease said of this agreement two years rent became due at once and was paid from the price of the other boat my boat went twice as fast as sandy's and was far more handy so that this bargain was fair and generous and did honour to all concerned the next and last thing before starting was to provide for poor bardie herself for i feared that hezekiah or some other unprincipled fellow might trump up a case and get hold of her and sell or by other means turn into money my little pet to the loss of my rights and perhaps her own undoing resolved as i was to stop all chances of villainy of that kind i went direct to colonel lower and to lady blewett here i made the cleanest breast that ever was scooped out almost i may declare that i kept in nothing except about painting the boat and one or two infinite trifles of that sort which it would have been a downright impertinence to dwell upon nevertheless colonel lower said that some blame might attach to me in spite of all pure intentions but lady bluett said no no she would not hear of it for a moment the only thing that surprised her was llewellyn's thorough unselfishness and chivalrous devotion to a child who was nothing to him she was a bewitching little dear no one who saw her could doubt that still it showed a very soft side to a wonderfully gallant character when through all modesty it appeared what womanly tenderness there had been and this proved how entirely right her opinion had been from the very first and what a mistake the good colonel had made in declining to let her even argue my dear eleanor my dear eleanor cried the colonel with his eyes wide open and his white hand spread to her i am surprised to hear you say so but we cannot go into that question now llewellyn begged for my opinion yours my dear as you have proved is of course more valuable still i thought that it was mine to be sure it was dear henry yours is what was asked for my rule is never to interrupt you but to listen silently to be sure eleanor to be sure and we always agree in the end my dear but so far as i can judge at present llewellyn although with the very best meaning and a display of the greatest valour come colonel even by his own account yes my dear great valour no doubt coupled with very sound discretion 
yet when i come to consider the whole i really do think that your hero might have entered more fully into these particulars about the boat of course he had no motive and it was simply an error of judgment henry there was no error at all what could he do when they would not even listen to him about the name of the ship if they would not listen about a ship it is it likely they would listen about a boat and a very small atom of a boat the thing is too ridiculous perceiving a pause i made my bow for the very last thing i could desire would be to sow a controversy between the gentleman and lady whom of all the county i esteemed the most and loved the best and i knew that if i caused dissension in a pair so well united each would think the less of me when they came to make it up together moreover my object was attained their attention was drawn to the child again the colonel as the nearest magistrate was put in legal charge of her i was now quit of all concealment and lady bluett had promised to see to the poor thing's education if ever she should need any this i hoped with all my heart that she would do and quickly too and indeed she was growing at such a pace after that long illness also getting so wonderfully clever about almost everything and full of remarks that might never strike a grown man till he thought of them that the only way or chance i saw of taking the genius out of her was to begin her education forgetting just now a good deal of my own and being so full of artillery i got master burkrolls to make the first start and show her the way to the alphabet our bunny now could spell cat and dog and could make a good shot at some other words and enjoyed a laugh at children head and shoulders over her whenever they went amiss and she from the master's face was sure of it but bardie had never been to school for i thought it below her rank so much and now i contrived for our great schoolmaster to come to my cottage and there begin it must have made the very gravest man ever cut from a block of wood laugh to behold master roger and her he with his natural dignity and well-founded sense of learning and continual craving for a perfect form of discipline yet unable to conceal his great wonder at her ways she on her side taking measure of him in a shy glance or two and letting her long eyelashes fall and crossing her feet with one shoulder towards him for him to begin with her he vowed that he never had such a pupil instead of learning she wanted to know the reason why of everything why had a two legs and a girdle while b had two stomachs and no leg at all c was the moon from the shape of it it was no good to tell her that c was the cat a cat had four legs and c had none and as for d being a dog she would fetch dear dutch if he would not believe her and show him what a dog was like and then perceiving how patient he was and understanding his goodness the poor little fatherless soul jumped up on his knee and demanded a play with him he did not know how to play very well because he was an ancient bachelor but entering into her sad luck from knowledge of her history he did the very best thing as i thought that ever had been done to her he put her on a stool between his knees and through the gloss of her hair he poured such very beautiful and true stories that one could almost see her mind like the bud of a primrose opening she pushed up her little hands and tossed her thick hair out of the hearing way and then being absorbed in some adventures like her own almost drowned she turned and laid her eyes upon his furrowed yet beaming face and her delicate elbows on his knees and drank in every word with sighs and short breath and a tear or two although from one point of view i did not like to be superseded so especially in my own department as might be said of story-telling yet i put small feelings away and all the jaundice of jealousy if i were bound to go wherever government might order me for the safety of our native land and with moderate pay accruing also with a high position and good hopes of raising it the least i could do was to thank the lord for sending those two poor children a man so wise and accomplished and kind-hearted bound over to look after them and yet i would almost as lief have committed them into the hands of mother jones who could scarcely vie with me but they promised never to forget me and the night before i went away i carried bardie back to scar and saw that black evan was dying End of chapter forty four chapter forty five of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording 
all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter forty five introduces a real hero my orders were to rejoin at pembroke on the tenth of june where the alcestis lay refitting and taking in stores for an ocean cruise of course i was punctual to the day and carried with me a fine recruit master rodney bluett i received not only minute directions from his lady mother but also a tidy little salary to enable me to look after him this was a lady of noble spirit and ready to devote her son for the benefit of his country because there was no fighting now nor any war in prospect also colonel lower came as far as the gate where the griffins are and patted his nephew's curly head and said that although it was not quite as he himself could have wished it he could trust the boy to be an honour to a loyal family and to write home every now and then for the sake of his poor mother for his own sake also i think the colonel might have very truly said because while he was talking so and trying to insist on duty as the one thing needful i could not for a moment trust my own eyes to examine him so we all tried to say good-bye as if there was nothing in it it was a very long good-bye even longer than we could by any stretch have dreamed of two or three years was the utmost that we then looked forward to but i tell you simple truth in saying that not one of us had the chance of seeing england much less any part of wales for a shorter period than seven years and two months added you may doubt me and say pooh pooh that was your fault and so on but you would be wholly wrong and from the admiralty records our captain could prove it thoroughly and what is much clearer than all do you think that captain drake bampfylde would have been seven years or even seven days away without sight of his beautiful lady isabel carey if it could have been managed otherwise it was a mixture of bad luck i can explain a good deal of it but not all the ins and outs we were ordered here and ordered there and then sometimes receiving three contradictions of everything until we should scarcely have been surprised at receiving signal h m s alcestis to the moon to wait for orders and if we had received that signal i believe we should have tried it being by this time the best trained and finest ship's company in the world we had ceased to be a receiving ship as soon as the war was over and now we're what they begin to call though it sounds against the grain to me an experimental ship and the lord knows that we made experiments enough to drown or blow up or blow arms off every man born on our blessed books they placed me at the head of it all until the others were up to it and a more uneasy or ticklish time i never have known before or since over and over again i expected to go up to the sky almost and you may pretty well conceive how frequent was my uneasiness nevertheless i still held on and government had to pay for it in four years time the old frigate began to be knocked almost to pieces and we made up our minds to be ordered home and set our memories at work upon all who were likely to meet us if still in the land of the living while at halifax thinking thus and looking forward to christmas time among our own families a spick and span new frigate came of the loveliest lines we had ever seen and standing gear the most elegant she took our eyes so much at once and she sat the water so that there was not a man of us able to think of anything else till all hands piped down this was the thetis if you please taken from the crapas in the very last action of the war a forty-six gun frigate but larger than an english sixty-gun ship the french shipbuilders are better than ours but their riggers not to be compared which is the reason perhaps why they always shoot at our rigging instead of our hulls at any rate having been well overhauled and thoroughly refitted at chatham and rigged anew from step to truck she presented an appearance of most tempting character it was a trick of the naval board to keep us together and it succeeded those gentlemen knew what we were by this time the very best ship's company to be found in all the service and as there were signs already of some mischief brewing their desire was still to keep together such a piece of discipline my humble name had been brought forward many times with approval but without any effect so far upon wages or position now however my lords had found it expedient to remember me and david llewellyn was appointed master's mate to the thetis 
if he should think fit to join her for the whole after our long service was a matter of volunteering there was not a man of us dared to leave captain drake bamfylde shabbily we turned over to the thetis in a body with him and the crew that had manned her from england took the old alcestis home again and junior lieutenant bluett now a fine young fellow walked the quarter-deck of the thetis so that you should have seen him but first and foremost was to see our great captain drake as ready as if he were always looking out for an enemy's ship from the foretop he walked a little lame on account of the piece of shark took out of him nevertheless we had not a man to equal him for activity i remember once when a violent gale caught us on the banks of newfoundland and the sky came down upon us black as any thundercloud the wind grew on us so towards nightfall that after taking in reef after reef the orders were to make all snug send down the top-gallant masts and lie to under close reefed main topsail and fore topmast staysail captain drake was himself on deck as he always was in time of danger and through the roar of the gale his orders came as clear as a bell almost from the mouth of his speaking trumpet main topmen to station close reef the main topsail mr bluett clew up clew up there is not a moment to lose my men spit to your hands and stick like pitch what are you afraid then all of you for the sail was lashing about like thunder having broken from the quarter gasket and when the men came to the topsail yard they durst not go upon it then a black squall struck them with blinding rain and they scarce could see one another's faces till a cheery voice came from the end of the yard hold on my lads hold on there you seem so skeery of this job i will do it for you tis the devil himself cried old ben bower captain of the main top let him fly let him fly my lads it is our captain said i who was coming slowly up to see to it myself prepared to do the job and shame all those young fellows skulk below you jelly-pots and leave it to me and the captain a cheer for the captain a cheer for the captain they cried before i could follow them and a score of men stood against the sky in the black pitch of the hurricane as if it were a review almost for they guessed what the captain must have done and it made a hero of each of them while they came slowly up the ratlins he clomb the rigging like a cat and before they got to the lubber's hole he was at the topmast head whence he slid down by the topping lift to the very end of the main yard such a thing done in a furious gale and the sea-going mountains high almost beat even my experience of what british captains are up to after that if he had cried make sail to heligoland with no landing to it there was not a man of us but would have touched his hat and said ay ay sir and now we first met captain nelson in command of the boreas a poor little frigate we could have sunk her as easily as we outsailed her but as senior to captain drake he at once assumed command of us although it was not in our instructions to be at his disposal the americans then were carrying on with the privileges of british subjects in trading with the leeward islands although they had cast off our authority in a most uncourteous and i might say headstrong manner captain nelson could never put up with the presumptuous manners of this race and he felt bitterly how feeble had been our behaviour to them these are people who will always lead the whole world if they can counting it honour to depart from and get over old ideas and now they were doing a snug bit of roguery with the leeward islands pretending to have british bottoms while at bottom yankees nelson set his face against it whenever he set his face his hand came quickly afterwards we soon cut up that bit of smuggling although the governor of the islands was himself against us captain nelson's orders were to enforce the navigation act and we did it thoroughly ever so many times i met him as he now came to and fro and he took the barge tiller out of my hand at least a dozen times i think for he never could bear that another man should seem to do his work for him any more than he could bear to see a thing done badly not that he found fault with my steering which was better than his own no doubt but that he wanted to steer himself and he never could sit a boat quietly from his perpetual ups and downs and longing to do something he knew my name he knew every one's name he called me old dio continually because the men had caught it up and in my position i could not perceive what right he had to do so i had him on my lap i won't say fifty times but at least fifteen for he never had sea legs at all when a heavy sea was running and i never thought it any honour but cherished some hopes of a shilling or so as for appearance at first sight he struck me as rather grotesque looking than imposing in spite of his full laced uniform and the broad flaps of his waistcoat 
his hair moreover was drawn away from his forehead and tied in a lanky tail leaving exposed in all its force rather a sad face pale and thin and with the nose somewhat lopsided also the shoulders badly shaped and the body set up anyhow and the whole arrangement of his frame nervous more than muscular in spite of all this any man who knows the faces of men and their true meaning could not fail to perceive at once that here was no common mortal the vigour and spirit of his eyes were such that they not only seemed to be looking through whatever lay before them but to have distinct perception of a larger distance and eagerness to deal with it and the whole expression of his face told of powerful impatience and a longing for great deeds dashed with melancholy the entire crew of his ship i was told were altogether wrapped up in him and would give their lives for him without thought and there was not one of them but was mad with our government for being at peace and barring captain nelson from the exploits he was pining for one of them struck at me with an oar when i said how puny nelson was compared with our drake bampfylde and only the strong sense of my position enabled me to put up with it and what i said was all the time the very truest of the true and that was why it hurt them so we being now the finest and smartest frigate in the service looked down upon that tub of a boreas and her waddle-footed crew and her pale pigtail commander with a power of ignominy which they were not pleased with and all the time we were at their orders and they took care to let us know it we would have fought them with pleasure if the rules of the service allowed it enough of that uncomfortable discontent and soreness the hardest point is for a very great man to begin to set forth his greatness we could not at the moment see why horatio nelson should thus sweep off with the lead so but after he had once established what he was and what he meant there was no more jealousy to this i shall come in its proper place i am only now picking up crumbs as it were and chewing small jobs honourably but against one thing i must guard our captain drake was never for a moment jealous of captain nelson it was one of the things that annoyed us most when we looked down on the boreas and would gladly have had a good turn with those fellows who assumed such airs to us to find that our beloved captain was as full of nelson as the worst of the boreasses and one of our men who went on strongly took six dozen and no mistake and acknowledged how well he deserved it that is the way to do things and makes all of us one family it is time for me now to crowd all sail for spithead as we did at last seven round years and two months were gone since i had seen o kimri and i could fill seven thousand pages with our whole adventures but none of them bore much on my tale and nobody cares for my adventures since i ceased to be young and handsome and sometimes i almost thought in spite of all experience that i had better have gone into matrimony with a young woman of moderate substance but as is the case with those things when i had the chance i scorned it not being touched in the heart by any one and so proud of freedom moreover the competition for a man amongst young women may become so lively as to make him bear away large down wind exactly what had happened to me in the land of devonshire three quarters of my pay had been assigned to roger burke rolls under my hand and signature for the maintenance of our bunny so far as the rent might not provide it and for the general management of things and then to accumulate so that after all i had not any amazing sum to draw remembering too that from time to time we had our little tastes of it nevertheless when added up i really was surprised to find that the good clerks thought it worth so much quill chop over it and now i had been for several years on the pay of a petty officer master's mate and looking forward to be master if he were good enough to drop off he was truly tough and would never drop off and i felt it the more because he was ten years my junior and unseasoned he drew half again as much as i did though he knew that i had done all the work he gave me two fingers to say good-bye which is a loathsome trick to me so i put out my thumb which was difficult to him and the next time i saw him he lay dead in the cockpit of the goliath in a word i got so little after all my long endeavours to secure the british nation from its many enemies that verily i must have fallen to the old resource again and been compelled to ask for alms to help me home in seventeen hundred and ninety as had happened to me in the year of grace seventeen hundred and fifty nine we sailors always seem to be going either up or down so much without seeming to know why perhaps it is a custom from our being on the waves so much however i was saved from doing such disgrace to the uniform and to my veteran aspect and the hair by this time as white as snow simply through the liberality of our captain bampfylde 
for he made me an offer both kind and handsome though not more perhaps than might be expected after our sailing together so long this was to take me home with him narnton court or the neighbourhood according to how the land might lie and thence to secure me a passage which is easy enough in the summer-time by one of the stone-boats to newton nottage i felt that i might have come home in grander style than this was like to be and yet it was better than begging my way and scarcely any man should hope to be landed twice in all his life at his native village from a man-of-war of course if master rodney blewett had still been with us he would have seen to my return and been proud of it but he had been forced to leave us having received his appointment as third lieutenant to the boadicea seventy four therefore i travelled with captain drake and made myself useful upon the road finding his coxswain who came with us in a miserably menial manner utterly useless whenever a knowledge of life and the world was demanded and over and over again my assistance paid my fare i am sure of it whether it were by coach or post because the great mass of seamen appear whenever they come on shore to enjoy a good cheating more than anything the reason is clear enough to wit that having seen no rogue so long they are happy to pay for that pleasure now it was said that even the admiralty had been playing the rogue with us stopping our letters and our news to keep us altogether free from any disturbances of home at any rate very few of us had heard a word of england except from such old papers as we picked up in the colonies and now after seven years how could we tell what to expect or how much to fear End of chapter forty five chapter forty six of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter forty six after seven years from exeter to barnstaple we crowded sail with horses tails and a heavy sea of mud leaping and breaking under the forefoot of our coach also two boys on the horses dressed like any admirals one with horn on his starboard thigh and the other with jack-boots only it was my privilege to sit up in the foretop as might be with cocks and toms in the mizzen-top and the captain down in the waist by himself we made about six knots an hour perhaps whenever we got jerks enough to keep up the swearing but the impatience of our captain showed how very young he was now at forty years of age according to chronology though nobody would believe it surely he might have waited well after so long waiting and if he could not chew a quid which breeds a whole brood of patience at any rate he had fine pipes and with common sense might have kindled them i handed him down my flint and steel and my hat to make a job of it but he shut up the glass and cried more sail in a voice that almost frightened me it was as dark as maintop tree holes by the time we got to barnstaple but we found no less than four fine lamps of sperm oil burning and tallow candles here and there and shops of spirit and enterprise the horses were stalled and the baggage housed in a very fine inn looking up the street and then the captain told toms and me to house up our jibs while he went out this we were only too glad to do after so much heavy rolling upon terra firma as those landsmen love to call it in spite of all earthquakes such as killed thirty thousand italian people when first i took to the sea again but before long toms and i began to feel that we had no right to abandon our commander so here we were in a town that hardly ever saw a royal sailor and could not be supposed to know for a moment what his duties were or even to take a proper pride in seeing him born harmless and here was our captain gone out in the dark with his cocked hat on and his gold lace shining wherever a tallow candle hung also with a pleasant walk as if he were full of prize money though the evil one had so patched up a piece that we'd never clinked a halfpenny when old jerry toms and my humble self had scarcely gone through three glasses he said to me and i said to him that we were carrying on too coolly 
in a hostile town like this and just at this moment the navy was down in popular estimation for such is the public urgency whenever we are paid for without being killed or wounded therefore jerry and i were bound to steer with a small helm and double the watch we beat up the enemy's quarters calmly finding none to challenge us and then we got tidings of our captain out upon the Bronton road jerry was a man of valour and i could not hang back to be far behind him and we had been concerned in storming many savage villages so we stormed this little town carrying our hangers and nobody denied us but before we were half a mile entirely out of hearing the mayor arose from his supper and turned out the watch and beat the drums and bred such alarm that in one street there were three more people alive ere morning meanwhile jerry times and i shaped our course for the Bronton road and hit it and held on to it and because no man in strange places knows what the air may contain for him jerry sang a song and i struck chorus with such an effect that the cows were frightened all along the hedgerows this put us quite on our legs again and a more deeply sober couple could not or at any rate need not be seen than that which myself and jerry were after two miles of walking in this manner steering free yet full of responsibility we doubled the last point of the road where it fetches round to narnton court and here we lay to and held council out of the tide of the road and in what seemed to be a lime kiln the coxswain wanted to board the house and demand our captain out of it we had carried all public opinion thus and the right thing was to go on with it but i told him very strongly so that he put down his collar from his ears to listen that no doubt he was right enough upon a hundred thousand subjects yet was gone astray in this and if we boarded a house at night after carrying all the town by storm what ship have we to bear us away from the mayor and his constables to-morrow in this dilemma who should appear but the captain himself with his head bowed down and his walk which was usually so brisk in spite of a trifling lameness his very walk expressing that his heart was full of sadness how much longer how much longer he was saying to himself being so troubled that he did not see us in the shadow there my own brother to have sworn it will the lord never hold his hand from scourging and from crushing me would that i were shot and shrouded it is more than i can bear in this gloomy vein he passed us and we looked at one another daring not to say a word how could a pair of petty officers think of intruding upon the troubles and private affairs of a post-captain even though since our ship was paid off we could hardly be said to serve under him blow me out of the mouth of a gun cried cox and toms in a shaking voice if ever i was so amazed before i would have sworn that our skipper was not only the handsomest but the happiest man in all the service then jerry i could have set you to rights how many times have i hinted that our skipper had something on his mind and none of you would hearken me true for you my lad i remember now you come to speak of it but we paid no heed because you looked so devilish knowing and would go no further old oh, dio i beg your pardon now there is good stuff in you friend dio thoroughly good stuff in you i should rather think there was i replied perhaps a little dryly for he ought to have known it long ago jerry i could tell you things that would burst the tar of your pigtail nevertheless i will abstain being undervalued so ho oh, shipmate haul your wind and hail i am blessed if it isn't old heaviside even in the dark i knew by the walk that it was a seaman and now my eyes were so accustomed to look out in all sorts of weather that day or night made little difference to my sense of vision which as you may see hereafter saved a british fleet unless i do forget to tell of it heaviside is my name sir and i should like to know what yours may be david llewellyn and so we met and i squeezed his hand till he longed to dance and i was ready to cut a caper from my depth of feeling i introduced him to jerry toms according to strict formality and both being versed in the rules of the service neither would take precedence but each of them hung back for the other fellow to pretend to it if he dared i saw exactly how they stood and being now as master's mate superior officer to both i put them at their ease by showing that we must not be too grand thus being all in a happy mood and desirous to make the best of things we could not help letting our captain go to dwell upon his own fortunes not that we failed of desire to help him but that our own business pressed 
gunner heaviside let us down to a little cabin set up by himself on the very brink of taw high-water mark as a place of retirement when hard pressed and unable to hold his own in the bosom of his family you may well be surprised for i was more i was downright astonished to find that this was my old ferry-boat set up like a dog begging on shores with the poop channelled into the sand and the sides eked out with tarpaulin a snugger berth i never saw for a quiet man to live in and though heaviside scorned to tell us and we disdained to ask him that as i guessed from the first was the true meaning of it this poor fellow had been seduced and i felt for his temptations when he came fresh from salt water and our rolling ideas of women into rapid matrimony with that sharp nanette he ought to have known much better and i ought to have given him warning but when he had made up his mind to settle i thought it was something solid i gave him the names as i may have said of good substantial farmers daughters owning at least a good cow apiece from the date of their majority also having sheets and blankets and as they told me many a time picked goose feathers enough for two and yet he must go and throw himself away upon that nanette so but when i came to hear his case and he for a moment would not admit that it was worse than usual or that he wanted pity more than any other men do and scarcely knew how far he ought or dared even to accept it and then at the gurgling of his pipe fancied that he heard somebody jerry and i squeezed hands for a moment and were very careful not to tantalize this poor man with our strong set resolution give a wide berth to all womankind was what we would have said if we could when now it was too late for him failing that stand off and on and let the inhabitants come down and push off their boats and vittle you poor heaviside fetched a sigh enough to upset all arrangements for jerry and i good widowers both were not likely to be damped at the proper time for jollifying by the troubles of a man who was meant to afford us rather a subject for rejoicing therefore we roused him up and said or at least conveyed to him that he must not be so sadly down upon his luck like this and hearing that he had six children now and was in fear of a seventh one i was enabled to recollect more than twenty instances of excellent women who had managed six and gone off at the seventh visitation this good news put such sudden spirit into my old shipmate that he ceased for a long time to be afeard of all that his wife could do to him he never said a word to show what his mind suggested to him whether good or evil only he made me tell those cases of unmerited mercy as he put it such a number of times that i saw what comfort he was deriving and then we challenged him to tell us what was going on with him he seemed rather shy of discussing himself but said that he was in sir philip's service as boatman longshoreman and river bailiff also pork salter as a son of the brine and watercress picker to the family in a word he had no work whatever to do as you may pretty safely conclude when a man is compelled to go into a catalogue of his activities this sense of ease overweighed him no doubt and made the time hang heavily after so much active service so that naval instructor heaviside moved about and began to gossip and having no business of his own spent his mind upon other folks now as we began to see through him and the monotony of a fellow who is under his wife's thumb without the frankness to acknowledge and enlist our sympathies for this universal burden both jerry and i desired to hear something a little more new than this all things are good in their way and devised by a finely careful providence so that no man whose wife is a plague to him can fail of one blessed reflection to wit that things are ordered so for the benefit of his fellow-creatures thus our noble heavy side not being satisfied with the state of things at home especially after he had appealed to nanette's strong sense of reason which bore sway in the very first week of half the honeymoon gloriously and after he had yielded slowly all his outworks of tobacco coming down from plugs to pipes and from pipes to paper things without stink enough to pay for rolling and so on in the downward course till he would have been glad of dry sugar-canes or the stems of old man's beard this poor but very worthy fellow gallantly surrendered and resolved to rejoice for the rest of his time in his neighbour's business mainly 
herein he found great and constant change from his own sharp troubles everybody was glad to see him and the wives who were the very hardest upon their own husbands thought that he showed himself much too soft in the matter of madame heaviside it was not his place when that subject arose to say either yes or no but to put aside the question as one that cannot be debated out of the house with dignity only every one liked him the more the moment they remembered how contagious his complaint was regard this question as you will according to lack of experience it was much for our benefit that the naval instructor was henpecked he had accumulated things such as no man can put together whose wife allows him to have his talk if he may lay down the law or even suggest for consideration he lets out half his knowledge and forgets the other half of it whereas if all his utterance is cut short at beginning he has a good chance to get something well condensed inside him thus if you find any very close texture and terseness in my writings the credit is due to my dear good wife who never let me finish a sentence i dare say she had trouble with me and i must be fair to her it takes a very different man to understand a different woman and these things will often touch us too late and too sadly i gave her a beautiful funeral to my utmost farthing and took her headstone upon credit almost before the sexton would warrant that the earth was settled that night my old friend heaviside who has led me from like experience into a wholly different thing showed some little of himself again before our whale oil light began to sputter and bubble too violently our society quite renewed his hope of getting away again especially when i explained to him that according to my long acquaintance with law no one could hold him accountable for any quantity of children which a frenchwoman might happen to have an alien to wit and a foreigner worst of all a frenchwoman could not expect all her froggy confinements to hold good in england he had committed a foolish and unloyal act in buckling to with an alien enemy and he deserved to pay out for it but i thought and coxswain toms was of the same opinion that poor heaviside now had suffered ever so much more than even a frenchwoman could expect of him and we begged him to go afloat again he shook his head and said that he had not invited our opinions but to a certain extent endeavoured to be thankful for them yet he suggested delicately that after being so long at sea we might have waited for our land legs before we became so positive and if we would not mind allowing him to see to his own concerns he would gladly tell all he knew about those of other people this appeared to me to be a perfectly fair offer but jerry toms took a little offence on account of not knowing the neighbourhood as superior officer of the three i insisted upon silence especially as from old times i knew what villainy might be around us and as soon as heaviside could describe quite clearly what tack i stood upon he distinctly gave his pledge to be open as the day therefore we all filled our pipes again and took fresh lights for them and looked at one another while this old chap told his story and please to mind that he had picked up a prawn netful of little trifles such as i never could stoop to scoop because he won such chances through the way the women pitied him only i must in shipshape put his rambling mode of huddling things if you please we are now going back seven years and more than that to the very date of my escape from devonshire so as to tell you what none of us knew until we met with heavy side chapter forty six